So Valley Group Homes preying on Native Americans to profit from their health care insurance. We're learning the FBI is investigating several fraud cases along with what appears to be human trafficking. Fox 10 investigator Justin Lum tonight has been looking into the money-making scam that's taking advantage of people's addictions all to make a buck. Justin with part three of preying on a people. Justin, is there any solution to all this? Well, to find a solution, we wanted to get some insight from people in charge of sober living homes. How easy is it to get paid thousands of dollars in Medicaid benefits off one person alone? And it's not as simple as opening a residential rehab center, especially if it's not licensed. The challenge is identifying the bad actors in a lucrative business. On a chilly January morning, we enter the zone, the largest homeless encampment in Phoenix, where nearly a thousand people live in tents on the streets. Hey, Leon, can we talk to you real quick? NG Sober Living? I'm police. You're with? They're, they're, not, they're not police, though. I'd like to talk they to you about your sober come. living home. You don't need to come here. No Can come. you just tell us about what's going on here with the services? I just want to know, if, you're, if your business is legitimate, can you just tell me a little bit more about your business? We're here because Michael White has been dropped off at the Human Services Campus, homeless again, after staying at NG Sober Living Home for several weeks. He spoke to us from the home in part two of our series, claiming patients don't get services they're entitled to. The zone is where he says he was first picked up by Leon Kaijamahe, listed as the managing director of the home. And he told me that um, you reported to Fox News, you told them about us, and you've been blabbing your mouth, and um, I'm going to drop you off right here. I don't want you in my house anymore. But Michael did not want to be dumped in the zone, and police arrive. We tried to talk to Leon before, but he declined. NG Sober Living Home is not a licensed sober house or behavioral group home per DHS records. The houses are unsupervised. There's drug and alcohol use in the homes, but it in, the houses are nice, so it literally enables somebody that is off the streets to have a nice place to sleep and stay in their addiction, and they don't want to talk about it because they're comfortable. The FBI in Phoenix won't tell us specifically which group homes investigators are looking into, but investigators say the overall scheme involves organizers targeting indigenous people from reservations in Arizona, New Mexico, South Dakota, and even at local flea markets and medical centers. The recruiters promise therapy services, yet offer alcohol during the transport. Organizers make sure victims are enrolled in the American Indian Health Plan through access so they can make money off the benefits licensed or not. You could be licensed, but then you could employ people who, for example, the Department of Health or Access have no idea are working under you. And there's more money to be made through outpatient programs, non-residential services, to meet patient needs. We found a program in Phoenix where we watched several clients get picked up. This man named Tony says he manages a sober living facility called Good Life Homes. I asked if the home is licensed. No, we are licensed, but we are trying to get licensed. You guys get paid through access to yeah. each client? Yeah, not through us, not, not straight to us, but we get paid through the, through the IOPs or the clinics. Looking at the access outpatient rates for behavioral health, some services cost nearly $400. Counseling and therapy can add up quick, as much as 30 bucks every 15 minutes. Tony is aware of the FBI's investigation and says he does not intentionally recruit Native Americans, nor does he allow alcohol or drug use at his group home. You're doing it the right way. Exactly. Is everybody, you know, other managers you know here, are they doing it the right way? I can't tell for sure. What should be done? <laughs> How do you fix it? Uh, to, to me, I could just say, let the FBI do it. It's right. One individual can bring in more than seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars into one of these homes with the uh, funding through access or even through Medicare, depending if it's a residential behavioral health facility or if it's a sober living community. Enter Senate Bill 1661, proposed by Democratic State Senator Teresa Hatatli. If passed into law, a behavioral health group home admitting a patient must notify their family as soon as possible. The client must be sober when transported to the home or referred by an approved provider of a tribal health care program. A first violation costs $750, a second violation worth $1,000, and a third means a license suspension for 30 days. They prey on the weakest people um, in my community who need the most help. At a recent hearing in front of the Senate's Health and Human Services Committee, Navajo Nation First Lady Jasmine Blackwater-Nigren 
spoke on behalf of the bill. She says there are more than 60 cases of missing natives out of Tuba City alone. We've witnessed unmarked vans drive onto tribal land, pull into gas stations. They find inebriated tribal members. They pull them in and drive them off without ever receiving proper consent from the individual. Lieutenant Governor Monica Anton of the Gila River Indian community says her niece was found dead at a sober living home after moving house to house. She says three other members of the community have also died in sober living homes. They allowed them to use fentanyl. They allowed them to drink still. So they'll call access up and say, hey, they relapse. I need another 30 days. So the 7,000 she talked about continues for another 90 days. A cycle not only preying on a people, but seeping into neighborhoods of unsuspecting families. I wanted to quickly break down some numbers. According to the State Department of Health's da database, there are licensed behavioral health adult group homes, 900 of them at this moment, and nearly 250 licensed sober living homes. So all told, you're looking about 1,200 licensed homes in those categories across the state that DHS knows of. Then you got to weed out the ones that are unlicensed. And the challenge, as I said, is trying to figure out who the bad actors are, uh, the ones allegedly getting in on the scheme. So that explosion of numbers would indicate somebody's figured out there's money to be made and there's now a proliferation of these homes. Yeah, what we're hearing is that they are popping up everywhere and what we've learned is at least in the city of phoenix there are zoning regulations for residential facilities so if you have a residence with six to ten uh, patients there you have to register with the city and now you can't be within 1320 feet of another group home mm -hmm. but let's say you have capped it at five residents now you're not at that six to ten mm -hmm. mark and who's really regulating this so yeah. there are definitely you can have challenges a whole cluster you can now have the cluster not advertising the loophole, but it's pretty clear. Right. It's one number off, five and There's six. There's money to be made. Exactly. Yeah. So this is definitely a problem that we're seeing everywhere right. is what we're doing. Yeah, what has the response been? This is a three-part series. Tonight was the final portion of that, and, and people have been calling. And I can tell you guys that we have never gotten, at least I, I in my career, a response like this for a story where we're getting dozens of messages, emails, phone calls, comments with people with multiple perspectives and stories, people giving us tips. And to be honest, this investigation for us started with a tip and that person uh, knows who they are uh, to give them some credit. So if you have a tip, just scan the QR code on your screen to email us fox10investigates at fox.com. Um, and to watch the rest of this series, you can head to fox10phoenix.com if you missed part one and part two of preying on the people. One more thing. Um, the FBI, pretty rare when they're in the middle of an investigation to go public with you about this. They've obviously got something big brewing. It's a good point. They want more information from the public. So those same tips, those stories uh, have anything to do with this scheme, please reach out to the FBI and provide your tips. Okay. A developing story out of Buckeye, DPS investigating the discovery of a man's body. Human remains were found just off of I-10 near the westbound on-ramp at Watson Road. The body was discovered by an ADOT worker who was cleaning the area. The on-ramp was closed for several hours while detectives investigated. New this morning, we can tell you a portion of the I-17 is back open. This was after a deadly crash. Uh, closed it down for several hours last night. This happening near Indian School just before 10 p.m. We're told an impaired male driver was speeding, rear-ending another vehicle. A woman in that second car rushed to the hospital where she later died. That suspect also taken to the hospital with injuries not considered life-threatening. Two other vehicles, those ended up being involved in that collision as well. Fortunately, neither of the drivers suffering any major injuries. A collision over the weekend in Goodyear that killed two bicyclists and injured more than a dozen others. Witnesses, they have come forward with new details about a second person in the pickup truck, but police say that they only know of one man right now the driver. And that driver has been identified as Pedro Quintana Lujan. Police say that he plowed into the group of bicyclists from behind. He is in custody facing a number of charges. Fox 10's Nicole Garcia spoke to two of the victims. What actually struck me wasn't the truck. It was the actual bodies and bike parts that were being pushed up from behind into me. Uh, the truck, um, when I looked up, the truck had already gone past me. 
um, but he was still under power and he stopped further down down the road. Survivors of Saturday's deadly collision are speaking out about the chaos and carnage that took the lives of two of their fellow cyclists. Police have identified them as 61-year-old Karen Melissa, a retired middle school teacher and longtime resident of Goodyear, and 65-year-old David Caro, a Michigan resident who was visiting for spring training. I landed on my back, on my head, and I think I rolled down, and I was just one of the lucky ones that ended up with only a concussion. According to court documents, 26-year-old Pedro Quintana told police his steering wheel locked up and he couldn't control his truck. Investigators say the pickup drifted to the right, hitting a concrete barrier before plowing into a group of 20 bicyclists from behind. Quintana told officers he had smoked marijuana on Friday, the day before the crash. Investigators submitted a blood sample to the DPS crime lab and are waiting for results to figure out if impairment was a factor. At his first court appearance, a judge set Quintana's bond at $250,000. The court doesn't necessarily have to believe that you intended to mow down 20 cyclists, but the court can reasonably infer from what's been alleged against you that you may have done something with a lesser intent, such as to scare them or annoy them. I'm going to pray for him because he's a young man. He, his whole life is ruined. His children's lives, his wife, and all the lives that he affected on the road. Mesa police also need your help finding a murder suspect. 27-year-old Catherine Katie Hansen is accused of shooting and killing a man on February 7th. This happened inside of a bedroom at a home off Palo Verde Street in Southern. Hansen has a tattoo over her right eyebrow that reads, Stay True. If you see her or know where she is, call Silent Witness.